Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Friday, September 13th, and we're going to keep our fingers crossed that nothing happens on Friday the 13th uh, during the show today. Today's episode is brought to you by Booz Allen. Accelerate today's missions with tomorrow's technologies as the leader in providing AI solutions to the federal government and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers, Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities rapidly, ethically, and securely. Learn more at boozallen.com slash defense. All right, joining me in our virtual studio today is the winner of the Future of Naval Warfare Essay Contest, Navy Commander Justin Cobb. His article is titled, No One Should Think the War Will Be Short. It appears in the September issue of Proceedings. If you have the print magazine, it starts on pages 18 and 19. Commander Cobb, welcome to the show. Bill, thanks for having me. Great to be here. It's awesome. All right. Before we delve into the article, uh, tell our listeners a bit about yourself. You're a, 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 a MH60 Romeo pilot, as I understand it, and now you're doing something that's more um, strike related. So what, what are you up to these days? Uh, I'm a MH60 Sierra pilot. Sierra uh, pilot. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. And I was also a, a Foxtrot Hotel HS guy uh, as well in HS11. Um, I was uh, previously, I uh, did my joint tour with NATO uh, uh, in shape and did uh, a lot of command and control stuff there. My CO tour at uh, Helicopter Training Squadron 18. And now I'm the Maritime Fires Officer for Strike Group 11. So that's the Nimitz Carrier Strike Group. I've okay. uh, been there just over two years. So I did a workup cycle and deployment. I extended because I love it so much. Uh, and so <laughs> we're going back through another workup cycle now with Nimitz. Uh, and it's been a ride. It's been really awesome. Kind of be ground level working through some of these problem sets. Nice. Nice. Are you a uh, a grad by any chance of the miser course that they teach out at the uh, Fallon these days? I am not. I am a, I'm a, a Switty, a Seahawk weapons and tax instructor. Got uh, it. I was formerly the training officer at, at Seawolf, uh, at NSOC, previously NSOC, now Nautic. Uh, so that was my, you know, back in the 2010s timeframe where I was. Okay. You did a tour out there at Fallon and then out in the desert, the high desert. That's right. Uh, and it was awesome. awesome. And uh, for, for our deployment, we have a miser on staff and miser has been super critical to, you know, operationalizing this for us. It was a uh, guy's call signs, meet locker. And now it's a uh, kill box Corbishly who are two uh, pretty awesome misers that are making this stuff happen, you know, in the seven fleet live. Yeah. I haven't met a miser in person yet, but I hear about these wizards that are out there now uh, disseminating out into the fleet who are, you know, uh, the experts on maritime ISR and, you know, targeting and all of that, that cycle. Uh, it sounds like a great program and uh, I'd, I'd love to have, uh, you know, some, somebody write about it for us, uh, get some more information in the pages of proceedings on that program. Oh, I'll tell them that they owe you an article. Yeah, that'll be a awesome. due out from this meeting. <laughs> awesome. Love it. Um so uh, I'll also note that you wrote another article for us earlier this year. That one was in the March issue. It was titled, The Navy's Not Ready for the Joint Fight in Indo-PACOM. Uh, it was well-timed uh, after the initial batch of the American Sea Power article. So uh, I'll commend to our listeners that article. But you know, let's talk about this month's piece. No one should think the war will be short. And the war you're referring to is the War of 2026 scenario that we published in the December 2023 issue, so about 10 months ago uh, in proceedings, which was a China-Taiwan scenario. So why won't it be short? Yeah, I, I mean, because I think it just, it can't be. Um, I think the political and military stakes are too high. I mentioned in the article, um, I mean, if a war starts, that uh, China has already staked the, the legitimacy of the PRC and the CCP on retaking Taiwan. So if they go and they move, uh, for them at stake is both uh, the legitimacy of their government, but also, you know, this effort that they're ongoing to like overturn the century of humiliation. And so, you know, once they start a war, losing it would just flip that on its head. I mean, the stakes are, they're all in if they start such a conflict. Yeah. And for, and for us, um, I, I think for us, it's our uh, legitimacy as the de facto leader in our rules-based order. I mean, those are the stakes. It's like global order you know, versus legitimacy of an entire government. And I just like can't imagine a world where that could start and we could sort of bop each other on the nose with an offensive campaign and then be like, actually, just kidding, let's stop. Uh, I just don't see that as being realistic. 
No, I think that's a good assessment. Um, some of the uh, other authors in the American Sea Power Project pointed out if uh, if the you know, as the stakes go up, as the escalation ladder increases, and your article talks a bit about escalation control, um, you know, if the U.S. loses a carrier, you know, how does that impact American public resolve? Uh, same thing with China, right? Um, for them, as you pointed out, that the CCP will have staked its reputation, uh, everything it's got, its legitimacy on this gamble, uh, and so hard for either side to, to walk away from it. In many ways, almost like, you know, Vladimir Putin has sort of staked so much of his legitimacy on uh, the campaign in Ukraine right now. You can see um, the Russians haven't been able to walk, you know, walk away from that one, even though it's not going well for them. Right. That's also become a very protracted campaign. Yeah, I think ju just like that, except with even higher stakes. I mean, w yeah. what would it take for Putin to, to walk away? It's the same the same kind of thing. There's like emotion and psychology, but there's also legitimacy and power and all those things like wrapped up in it. it just seems sort of naive to think you could walk away from that. Yeah. So uh, you write early on in the article is a quote I loved, uh, a reflexive desire to immediately surge forces into combat and win a rapid victory also is misaligned with current capabilities risk tolerances and escalation management priorities on the U.S. side, right? So in one of my uh, later uh, PME courses while I was still on active duty, you know, somebody said the American way of war, Americans, you know, love to, you know, go, go charge into the sound of the guns, you know, sort of play a rules-based war. We think it's going to be rules-based, um, high level, uh, use everything that we've got, go at it sort of, you know, Operation um, Iraqi Freedom uh, or uh, Desert Shield, Desert Storm uh, way. Uh, and, you know, hopefully win easy, win win early, go home, right? Um, and so you say that that desire is sort of misaligned with the capabilities, the risk, the escalation management priorities. So unpack that for a minute. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, uh, I mean, as I have read more and more and more kind of studying to write these two articles, um, you kind of see a couple of camps that there are like in academia and then, you know, circles of folks who write and delve in this world. Um, and one of the papers that I use in this article as a reference is a RAND study called U.S. Military Theories of Victory for a War with the PRC. That study actually kind of proposes the opposite of what I say in my article, but I, I use them as a, a quote in the article. Rand basically says, oh, hey, we looked at the problem and there's like five or six versions of how you might tackle this problem, but really only two are meaningful. One of them is denial. Deny successful lodgment in Taiwan, prevent the Taiwan invasion. You got to snip it in the bud. And the other one is, you know, basically uh, make them pay militarily. But we don't think that one is even very successful. So denial. So Rand says it's got to be denial. We got to stop them, you know, in Taiwan. And there's definitely people kind of lining up behind that. And I think that, you know, you hear, you know, the kind of when we talk about uh, creating a hellscape and in the Taiwan Strait and on the beaches in Taiwan, that's that Rand study number one theory of victory for stopping the war. I, I think there's like a couple of ways to achieve that way. One would be massive amounts of long range uh, missiles of, you know, exquisite unmanned systems that's like kind of way one it's very unmanned very exquisite real high end that kind of stuff or like the replicator initiative you know it would be like thousands or tens of thousands of cheaper drones which yeah. you know so those are kind of that and then the other way is you just are willing to accept really huge risks and you surge conventional forces in and you just go force on force those are the the two ways one isn't currently realistic and the other way isn't sort of like politically realistic i just don't think the american people or government or anybody is kind of willing to internalize those risks um but even if we did like even if we did those one of those two things or combinations of those things and we and we executed the denial strategy my real main question is like we'll step back what next if we achieve denial at what cost was it so i'm envisioning you know, hundred, dozens or hundreds of PRC vessels sunk and on fire and like thousands or tens of thousands of Chinese sailors, Marines, airmen who were dead or dying or in the ocean. <laughs> Could that be it? 
could you do that and then nothing else happens? I mean, would we let that happen? So I, I just think it's the, okay, but Taiwan is, would just be the first battle in something that's to come. And, you know, we've got to be postured for that. And if you go that hard early and you accept risks that, you know, are tough, um, I, I just think that that would be super difficult. So I think Rand missed the mark in the first place by thinking mm -hmm. somehow the war is just about Taiwan. If the war starts, it's not just about Taiwan. Yeah, and uh, I, I think you were hinting there at, or at least I, I perceived a bit that, you know, if if it got that um, kinetic early, right, with, as you point out, you know, tens of thousands, uh, maybe more of, uh, of Chinese soldiers, sailors, airmen, et cetera, you know, dead, um, what what's the risk for to escalate? So, you know, we know that China is building up a massive nuclear arsenal, right? They're building more silos out in their Western desert. They're building more SSBNs. They're build, they have a, a, a very active nuclear weapons production capacity that's growing. We've had other articles and proceedings on that. So what's the temptation going to be then to escalate to a, an even higher level of war, right? Yeah, and they'll be subject to the same kind of uh, like political emotion that we are. I mean, you can yeah. imagine the public in China just outcry if that were to happen. And now you could get into this terrible escalation spiral. So, I mean, that's the, you know, current capabilities. Are we really prepared like now to do, you know, the option one risk tolerances? Would we, would we be willing to do kind of the option two? And then even if we did, is it aligned with escalation management principles that probably are pretty important to us politically? Um, and like who we are as a nation. Yeah. So you go on to write, and I'll quote, uh, rather than focus on fast victory, the USC services should create an alternate strategy and a complementary force design around capabilities that enhance strategic deterrence, provide response options that enable manageable escalation and rely on tactics, techniques, and procedures to produce sustainable lethality while husbanding forces and minimizing risk. What are some of the key characteristics or capabilities that you would design into such a strategy? Yeah, I, I actually thought um, you did brilliant work with the September edition because the articles for, uh, you know, be prepared to board, the strengthening the allies with uh, Japan um, and the, the like legal warfare of, uh, of uh, what would be required for, the, for uh, an embargo type uh Prize, I think those, prize law, right? Prize law, yeah, yes, sir, yeah. Th those, those are all like squarely what I'm thinking about as I'm thinking, uh, you know, ways to manage escalation, um, and then some of the other ways, some of the more, uh, you know, real politic. Uh, I, I would be pretty big on the the uh, uh, non-attributional stuff. So I mentioned the article, the containerization of weapons. I think is a huge part of a, a strategy that allows us, e even if we're non-attributional in ways that are kind of. Mm, tongue in cheek. I mean, we did that during the Cold War with the Soviet Union and the Soviets did it to us. We very well knew that. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure what you're talking about. Uh, so if we were to give containerized SM6s to uh, like a Taiwanese defense force or, oh, a, got it, got it. Yeah, or a disassociated, you know, if you created a group of expatriated Taiwanese that you gave group three vessels with containerized missiles, I mean, we could sort of say, hey, you know, we're helping these guys because we care about the global world order, but that's not the United States. You know, we're really sorry for your loss. Um, you could do the same thing with Japan, with the Philippines, with partners and allies. Uh, I think we lean much more heavily on NSW and submarines because those can be quite non-attributional. So you can really help put a sting into a response where we kind of keep a distance, um, but we, we, you know, make sure that there's a price that's being paid. Um, and, and that's kind of what I mean. Um, and, and I think there's lots of, and, and in the meantime, you know, we're reinforcing our own, you know, uh, A2ID, uh, integrated air defense systems to protect our allies and our partners. Uh, that also kind of tightens the noose around whatever China's doing. And all that's predicated on the fact that we don't accept that the loss of Taiwan would be the end of this thing in any case. It's just going to be the beginning of pain. <laughs> the beginning of pain. Yeah, it's a good way to put it. Um, I'm, I'm recalling, you know, as, uh, as we talk about this and um, some of the other authors in the American Sea Power Project 
who looked at this, this problem that we set up, the War of 2026 scenario. And if you haven't read it to our listeners and, and viewers, the December proceedings, or you can just do a Google search, War of 2026 proceedings, it'll come up. Um, and then we published a, a series of articles by domain experts, so submarines, strike warfare, electronic warfare, space warfare, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, this future of naval warfare essay contest, which Commander Cobb won, $5,000 first prize. Con congratulations, by the way. Thanks. Um, uh, you know, was, was our request to readers to read all those articles and the scenario and then take it a step further. Like, okay, so what else needs to be done or what strategy or tactics, techniques, what capabilities are required, right? Um, and so it was interesting to us when we read these, we thought people were going to go a little bit deeper down into capabilities and and maybe further refine some of the well our submarines need to have these kinds of weapon systems or this needs to be our new c2 structure etc but instead you and, and others really took it back up to an operational and strategic perspective and said hey this is really hard fight and so we're going to have to look at it differently differently than the way the united states has fought other wars in the last you know 20 30 years right um, so, so good on you for that. I think it was it was brilliant. And you said, you know, congrats to us for putting together a good uh, a good September issue. Really, it was congrats to the other winners and yourself for looking. You know, th those three four articles all kind of came together very nicely, and I think in a very complimentary sense. So, um, your your piece and um, the the uh, Marine Major who took third prize uh, on prize law. You know, essentially. Uh, seizing Chinese maritime merchant merchant ships around the world. Um, anyway, there's and and the the piece on the getting the ability to and the permission to move expeditionary advance base, you know, Marine Corps and uh, stand-in forces around in the Japanese home islands, particularly the southern the Ryukus, uh, much more quickly and rapidly, and and uh, into places where the Chinese maybe haven't seen them before, right? So that the combination of those articles, I think, is quite brilliant. Um, not not our design, um, but um, uh, the um, uh, you talk about some um, real points about deterrence and escalation control in your article. Uh, so walk through a couple of those. You know, one was this idea, and it, it's throughout your article the fact that it's important for the United States and our allies to convince China that it would be a long slog and not a quick fait accompli. Um, build on that for a minute, if you would. Yeah, I, I, uh, I had the quote in there from uh, Protracted Great Power War, which was the Dr. Andrew, I'm going to mispronounce his name, Krapinovich. Krapinovich, right. Yep. Krapinovich, okay, from uh, CNAS. That if you haven't read that, uh, I would encourage like everybody listening to, I, I think that's a brilliant piece of, of, uh, of, of scholarly work. Uh, and I pretty much line up behind. I mean, it had really influenced kind of the way that I thought about the problem. Um, and he, he talks about, you know, how wars get protracted and all that kind of stuff. So um, in, in that particular case, um, you know, he mentions reasons that they would get protracted. And I think that that's where, you know, we make a big effort to convince, you know, the PRC uh, that protraction is, in fact, what awaits them. Um, and I, I made a couple points. I just like briefly referenced times not on their side. They've got demographic issues, economic issues, political issues. Um, I will say, I got to give the PRC credit, since I was in college, you know, in the late 90s and early 2000s, my economics professors were telling us, hey, the, the economic collapse and demographic collapse of China is imminent. And, you know, we heard it again in the 2010s, and they, they just are able to manage their way out of it. So I got to give the PRC credit. I don't know how imminent it is. I, they seem to be really effectively managing it, but it seems like it's going to be hugely problematic. So the incentive is for them to move quickly and the incentive is for them to fight, to limit the fight to just the South China Sea, which means we just take advantage of where we have advantages, which is in time and space. Um, and and for, for me, that's real politic. It's our alliances. Um, and and, and it, in that way, convincing the Chinese, uh, no matter what happens in Taiwan. I mean, we'll we'll do what we can. I think we should. I think we sort of owe it, even though we're in this weird place with Taiwan. Um, but we kind of owe it to the free world that we don't let somebody 
just topple over you know a democracy um, that's uh, that's aligned with us. Uh, but but we can do that in ways that don't you know drive us into you know something that's terrible, uh, and and we can do it sort of slowly. Yeah, um, I, I was going to um, mention a, a couple of articles that, uh, that I, I think complement some of the ideas that you put forward in your article. We had uh, uh, Admiral Sandy Winnefeld, who was uh, wrote one of the articles last December, which was "Mine Warfare Could Be Key." Right. So the United States, we we play the U.S. Navy tends to pay lip service to mine warfare um, until we you know uh, have a ship that gets hit in the you know perhaps the Persian Gulf, like the USS Princeton did um, back during Desert Shield, Desert Storm time. Um, uh, but, you know, Admiral Winterfeld's point is that if we had the ability to mine Chinese ports, never mind the Taiwan Strait, but if we, you know, that's economic warfare, right? And Tom Clarity, Captain Tom Clarity, uh, his article was uh, tighten the belt and cut the roads, you know, a, a reference to China's belt and road strategy that, yeah, if you go after them economically, if you go after their long tendrils around the world, um, which would hinder their ability to, you know, to pull natural resources back to China to fuel their economy, you know, you're, you're again, you're playing economic warfare. It's a longer game. It's not going to be an immediate relief to, to Taiwan if Taiwan's under attack. But these are the kinds of things that if we talk about them, if we build those capabilities, will be a deterrent to China because they realize, they will realize, hey, if we take this on here, um, you know, the United States and allies are going to pay it play a, go a global game against us, which is going to be, as you point out, protracted, right? Um, and in some places, it might even be, be deniable, right? If there, there might be aspects of that where it's like, yeah, we didn't do that. You know, the Egyptians did that or, you know, an another, another country did that. Um, all good points. Um, you talked about this a little bit before uh, at, a, at a sort of strategic and operational level. But I want to ask you to take it down more tactically now because there's some really good stuff in your article on this. Um, tools required uh, for this kind of a strategy, what's needed um, and what's not needed in the immediate you know, next couple of years? What are some of those key capabilities? Yeah, um, I, I think, uh, you know, for me, I, I talk about the C5 ISRT um, and I think all domain and uh, in the last article too, I, I'm really talking about the joint all domain command and control stuff. I do think we as a as a force like the DoD is doing pretty awesome work across that field. Um, there's there's definitely you know more capabilities that we'll need uh, to kind of get at their A2AD structure to compromise it, to deny it, to poke holes in it. Um, I feel pretty heartened that uh, you know that's being taken to action. Um, I did mention like briefly in the article if anything, you know, too much of a good thing. So basketed underneath that, I, I kind of talk about um, how we need to do uh, over o OTHT, like over the horizon targeting. Uh, and that needs to be, you know, a, a system that the whole joint force can leverage. And you'll certainly need that even in a, if you're doing escalation management, non-attributional type attacks, right? You have to be able to, to get the targets and give them to a proxy so that a proxy can action against them. Um, and in that field, there's almost so many things happening that it's like, it's too much. Uh, I, I feel like every time I wake up and go into work, there's another common operating picture app that I have to learn to deal with. Uh, ah. That's And it's overwhelming, like what targeting software we're using, what different tools we're using. And uh, there's so many companies, it would take me the rest of the podcast to lay out who all's got their hands in the pot of what those things are. Um, probably that should be reined in. I mean, we probably need to focus a little bit more on the, you know, how we're going to do over the horizon targeting and how we're going to manage it as a joint force. On the weapons side, um, it's this. I think we already have a lot of the things we need, uh, or they're very close at hand. Like, you know, they've they've tested, they're successful, and maybe we're not in full production phase. Uh, I think we need to really put some money behind that. The in the things we don't need yet. Uh, I mean, I'm kind of poking at, you know, the what I in my mind is the forty million dollar self-aware, exquisite, invisible, loyal wingman program or something. I mean, that looks awesome, and I'm not saying that that's not the future of warfare, but I don't think it's the future of warfare in the next, you know, five, six, seven years. 
and also we can't afford that um and we'll need mass and i mentioned in the article uh, i mean how have how have russia's hypersonics changed the war in ukraine have they won because of them because they have really cool super fast big caliber missiles and stuff no they have not uh drone warfare is certainly changing the face of what war looks like in ukraine but has somebody won has it been decisive no it has not uh, so I think, you know, there's a lot of things we already have and tactics that we already have in place. We just like need more of them. Uh, you know, we need more Lorazm. We need more Jasm. We need more Harpoon. We need more, you know, Standard all of those things. Standard missiles, uh, SM6, the, the reveal. Uh, we need like a lot of those. Uh, we need more Tomahawks. Um, I think we have a lot of the tools or we're like right on the cusp of mass producing those tools. Um, and I think that that's where we should put our, our money. The other stuff will come. In, in GAD uh, and all the sixth generation, you know, hive mind things. I think those are awesome. Um, but I think maybe those need to go on hold for a little bit while we kind of get our house in order to to, to uh, enable strategic deterrence and defense in the short term. Especially if you ascribe to the Davidson window, uh, which, which I do. I mean, it makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. And uh, our War of 2026 scenario uh, by design takes place within that Davidson window, right? The 24 right. to 28 time frame or 23 to 27 time frame. Um, yeah. And on, on like the sub tactical level, I think, you know, about EABO, which I'm a big believer in. Um, but I think it just needs to be enabled more than it's being enabled. I mean, I talked about it in the article. I mean, we need more Marston matting. We need more bulldozers and construction equipment and more capability for expeditionary reload at sea. We need more, uh, uh, you know, expeditionary comms capability for mission planning and for command and control. Um, and we need to practice that more frequently, right? Yeah. We're sending yeah. a dead out to an island that has to do all of its maintenance, like little expeditionary maintenance detachments that have little sipper pucks that can, you know, dial in. It's like that level of granularity. And I'll say, like, I think a lot of that stuff is real, right? I think NSW has been using that stuff probably for a couple decades. Um, but you would need to proliferate it and get it into the hands of regular troops and regular maintainers and regular sailors and then start, like, flexing those muscles. Yeah. Logistics as well, right? So we've had a couple of uh, articles in the American Sea Power Project about logistics and about how Navy post 9-11 really got into a, uh, you know, just in time logistics. Um, you know, we leaned out the logistics force, the combat, um, you know, supply ships, et cetera, um, bringing that back and providing, getting more uh, uh, just numbers, you know, we really need the numbers. Um, to, to to be able to ensure that we can resupply um, and uh, rearm uh, you know ships that are forward or you know in the in the weapons engagement zone even if they come back out you got to have supplies you got to have logistics there close by uh, to keep them in the fight right or get them back in the fight I think sometimes we need to like drill that lesson home maybe more with our non navy counterparts who maybe don't understand if you have not done a Westpac and you don't understand the tyranny of distance and how important it's just such a huge battle space. And when you, when it's gas and bombs and food and all of those things, uh, I mean, yeah, army marches on its belly. I mean, so does the Navy, uh, except it's much harder and over expanses of uh, distances that are like hard to comprehend. You know, when you leave a uh, home port in San Diego and you start to head West, you just get a scope in the transit for what a wicked problem set that is to keep a fighting force moving at those kinds of distances. Yeah, yeah, great point. Um, you you write about these ideas as an evolution in military affairs, not a revolution. So in the last 20 years or so, there's been a lot of talk about the revolution in military affairs, RMA. Um, but you, you dial that back and you say, no, this is really evolutionary. Explain that a bit. Yeah, I, I think... Like what I would advocate for, and I'm always like a, you know, I want results like tangible results now, <laughs> is uh, not a future uh, military that's like, you know, future design force. Um, I, I mean, I do think that that should happen ev evolutionary, but it's, it shouldn't be radically different than what we're good at. And I think it also needs to recognize what we're not good at. And so what I think, you know, we're good at uh, for sure, like where our real strengths are as a country, first and foremost is uh, allies and partners. 
So I like look at what is the United States good at, and I look at NATO as a model of a way to confront the Soviet Union, and it was very effective. And I think that that kind of, and we have really strong alliances in the Pacific. So reinvesting in those alliances, I think is like key. At, at the military level, what I think we're really good at is actually joint all domain operations. I mean, if if you're engaged in those, you might think, ah, tinkles, but actually we kind of suck. <laughs> but <laughs> but I completely disagree. I mean, we've got problems. There's always like crypto issues and comms issues and stuff like that. But when I look at the next best military, oh, we're far. I mean, we are really good at massing all domain firepower at like working the command and control. I mean, not without uh, problems, but we're really good at it. So I think, you know, that's a strength and we need to leverage those two strengths, the allies and partners and our ability to do the kind of joint all domain stuff. And that, yeah. that's why I think if you do that in like a risk managed way, uh, where you're not flowing everything in at once, but you're doing the very long range maritime strikes, you're emphasizing the roles of submarines, of long range bombers, of expeditionary, you know, rhinos, F-18s that are out there. Um, and you leverage that in with the with the rest of our allies and partners and some non-attributional, you know, players that are working on our behalf. I think that's the kind of evolution and tactics. It's kind of small, actually. Um, and then things we're not good at, unfortunately, we're not good uh, anymore uh, at reconstituting forces. And that's something we have to be mindful of. I mean, if we if we go into a big knockout, drag out brawl, well, we're going to have to reconstitute those forces. And we just don't have the, the, the facilities that we did anymore. So that was another recent article uh, that uh, that's out there for the, we need to create a new shipyard. I mean, among other things, uh, and again, there's movement happening on that, but not like immediately. So if we recognize that we're not good at that, um, I think that that's important. And then the kind of last thing to consider too is, I, I, I think, you know, being cognizant of the fact that we're a democracy, and I don't consider that a weakness. I consider it a strength. But it still requires that the American people support our effort. Um, and we, we like to think of ourselves as the sheepdog, like from the movie. That's how Americans like to think of themselves, as exceptional, as the good guys, as upholding the global order. And I, I wonder, like, if you move that fast, that hard, that violent, if you spiral the thing into escalation, um, do you have the support of the American people? And that's reconstituting the people part of the force because you need both the, the things to be built but we also need the folks to enlist to rally to the flag to come to defend our way of life and our order um and again i think that that's why I like you know my general outline of the article it's why i think it's more of an evolution than this like radical redesign of who we are as a military um and and, and i guess i guess that's it hopefully that answered the question no i totally did yeah um Tickles, we could talk for uh, another probably 45, 50 minutes, but we're about out of time. Um, can you share your call sign story with us? A gentleman never tells, Bill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> some some call signs are like that. I totally get it. Um, any any saved rounds? Anything we didn't cover or, or questions I should have asked that I didn't ask? Uh, no, I really enjoyed the conversation. I actually had a lot of fun writing the article. Um, I feel like I have had a lot to say, and the article was like a helpful way to say it. Uh, thanks to US and I and Proceedings for putting together the whole thing. Uh, it's been awesome to just read through all the contributors. Uh, and it's fun to know that everybody's like rowing in the same direction, like everyone's yeah. kind of moving. It's pretty awesome. It's heartening. It makes you feel like, you know, we, we got it. We're good. Yeah, yeah. Well, this uh, war this essay contest, the Future of Naval Warfare essay contest, was a, a one-off. It was just this year. It was kind of the capstone for our American Sea Power project. But we do probably ten or twelve other essay contests throughout the year. Uh, coming up are the General Prize essay contest. Uh, we're judging the Marine Corps essay contest right now. We'll we'll have uh, more coming up in the uh, in the spring and in the summer next year. Uh, keep your eyes out for uh, for our essay contests, and uh, you know if you if you think oh, I could never write for an essay contest, you absolutely can. Um, Tinkles, you got you were you know top one of uh, over a hundred. I think we had hundred and twenty five or so uh, entries in this contest. So we had a massive outpouring. It was a lot of reading, um, but we've got more art, more not just the winners. 
that are in the September issue, but we'll probably have another 10 to 20 articles that we'll publish that come from this essay contest. So as I often tell people, um, the gouge is to write for our essay contest, because even if you don't win the contest, we will look at your article. We look at every article through a lens of whether we should publish it or not. So even non-winning articles from our essay contests, a lot of them, a large percentage of them do get published in one form or another. So uh, keep writing for us. Uh, you've got two two so far this year. I hope uh, you'll have time while you're out there on the on the Nimitz and getting prepared to deploy again. Will you deploy with the strike group again or will you leave before deployment? Right now, I'm planning to leave right before deployment. So, Got it. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll carry him through Com Two X, which I'm really looking forward to, and then uh, and then hopefully PCSing shortly after that. Do you know where you're going next? Uh, I rather I better not say. And okay. I don't have I don't have paper. It's all don't jinx it. stuff. Yeah, yeah yes, don't sir. Jinx it. Got it. Well, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, we are about out of time now. My guest has been Commander Justin Cobb, winner of our Future of Naval Warfare essay contest. His article, No One Should Think the War Will Be Short, is in the September Proceedings, and it's online at usni.org. Click on the Proceedings tab, and you can't miss it. Justin, congrats on winning the contest. Keep writing. Thanks, Bill. All right. This episode was brought to you by Booz Allen. Accelerate today's missions with tomorrow's technologies as the leader in providing AI solutions to the federal government and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers, Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities rapidly, ethically, and securely. Learn more at boozallen.com slash defense. If you're a member of the Naval Institute, thank you. Your support is important to everything we do. If you're not a member, please consider becoming one today by going to usni.org slash join. And just a, a reminder for our members, uh, one of the new member-only benefits is the USNI News Team's C Scroll newsletter comes out every week on Thursdays, and it is only for our members. So if you're not getting the C Scroll newsletter, it means you're not a member. Become one today. Until next episode, remember victory begins at the Naval Institute. <laughs>